Good morning, everyone. This is Jason Merkel with Horizon Hobby, and I'm joined here today by Mr. Matt Andron to talk about something very, very, very exciting. Uh, this is something you've been working on for a long time now. Absolutely, yep, sure have been. The E-Flight EC-1500. Uh, before we get too far, a couple people have asked, what does EC-1500 even mean? Uh, it means E-Flight Cargo. Yes. So, a little generic there, but uh, kind yeah. of fit, you know, we... Uh, we're trying to come up with a good name for it and just seemed to fit because it just can do almost anything. So. Right. Yeah, we talked about, it, 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 in essence, it's a cargo airplane, yes. Right, right. And uh, we'll get to that here in a little bit. It's not just a cargo airplane. That wasn't the only intent of it. Uh, you know, the goal was to come up with something that was um, cargo looking and capable, but then also kind of did things that people would would not expect. Right. And then that would widen the audience that would be interested in the model. So Absolutely. we'll get to that here in a minute. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about your background. You've been at Horizon for, gosh, a while now. Uh, just uh, a little over 14 years. So. 14 years. Holy cow. And uh, you basically have been a lifelong hobbyist. Oh, yeah. Yep. So you've been scratch building and flying RC models since, you know, before you were in middle school, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. and so I remember hearing some cool stories about uh, some of the gliders that you scratch build. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and I remember those those days because I think I was around the same time for me and electric power really wasn't a thing yet. Exactly. Um, getting engines to run reliably, especially if you were at a high altitude. Oh, yeah, we were about uh, 7,000 feet above sea level. So you didn't have enough power with a lot of... No, it was typically typical challenging. So. Yeah, yeah, so a lot has changed since then. Absolutely. Uh, and then, uh, so, so after you kind of started in your hobbying side of the career, uh, uh, kind of hobbying side of things, you went into the career of, yep. of this. Uh, you worked at a hobby shop? I did. I worked at the hobby shop in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. That's right. And then you uh, came here from there. Yes. Right? Yep. And then you worked, I think, in product support originally? I was consumer sales for a little consumer over Consumer sales. Yeah. That's right. And then you made the transition to uh, product development. Yep. Yep. And then early on, you were working on primarily balsa airplanes. Exactly. I was kind of the aircraft technician, so I'd do a lot of the building of the samples and reporting on them and things like that. Yeah, that's right. You did some really cool uh, kind of like... Uh, you know, kit bash, little arf bash exactly. things where you would take some of our arfs and you would modify them. Yeah, I remember yeah. you uh, took a cub. I can't remember which model cub it was. Was it the quarter scale cub? Yep, yep. And you uh, changed it to a kind of a turboprop front end. You put a five blade prop on it. Yep, yep. And which, uh, you know, double slotted flaps. And double slotted flaps. Yep, That's yep. right. And so a part of your inspiration for that, and I think um, for those that don't know you and kind of don't know your background, you just love all things aviation. Yep. But at the same time, you have an affinity for. Uh, Cargo aircraft, passenger aircraft, airliners. Yep, yep. But you also love stole aircraft. Exactly. And, you know, to kind of tie those two together, for me, the thing that's been kind of the fun thing to play with is high lift devices, whether it oh, be right. flaps, slats, leading edge droops, you know, vortex generators, things like that. That just really intrigues me and in how it changes the performance of the model. Yes, I know a lot of aircraft that you've worked on the last few years incorporate those elements. Exactly. Uh, so, probably the one everybody knows the best is the timber. Yeah. So Matt originally designed the Timber, um, and the intent there was to have an airplane that looked like a real aircraft. Yes. But was optimized to fly better than. Exactly. So it's kind of like, you know, imagine we, we started with a, a clean sheet design. We said, well, this high wing kind of standard configuration will work well, but if I change the uh, the cord of the wing, if I uh, you know build the structure so I don't need struts, exactly. if I adjust the the length of the fuselage and the size of the stab, I can make this thing perform better than a full scale aircraft. And I think a lot of people would agree. Timber is a phenomenal flying airplane, yeah. and uh, and that kind of leads into this. This is a kind of follows a similar design idea. Exactly. Exactly. So your goal here was to have an airplane that, that looked somewhat realistic right, right. and that did things that an airplane when you just got a kind of a, gl a glance at it you're like oh this is a cargo airplane it's going to do yeah. cargo airplane things it's going to you know fly around nice and easy and smooth and you can drop some cargo if you want um, but then you took that and you said well we can cheat the the wing area, we can cheat the wing design, we can cheat the stab design to end up with an airplane that flies better than exactly. a full scale model. So I know some guys have been harping on, hey, this looks like a cargo airplane, it should fly just like a cargo airplane right, right. and nothing but. And you know, if that was the case, then the timber should fly just the way it looks, which is not really do anything spectacular. Exactly. It shouldn't necessarily be able to take off and land in such short distances or right. be as aerobatic as, you know, especially the latest iterations are. And so from that, one thing we learned about Timbers, guys, is that they appeal to a very wide audience. Exactly. They appeal to low time, low skill pilots, and then they also appeal to more experienced pilots. Right, absolutely. I mean, there's so many things you can do with it. You can just you know cruise it around or have some fun do aerobatics, and you can fly with the floats and everything. So you got a lot yep. of options with that airplane in terms of how you want to fly. So, so versatility, yep. Yep. wide flight envelope, 
and then that makes it have wide appeal. Exactly. And then I know when we came out with the Timber X earlier this year, people were like, what are you doing? That makes no sense. Right. And then we also even went a step further and we took the original timber, turned it into the turbo timber, not only with more power, but we stiffened the wing exactly. and we made it more aerobatic capable. And what's the end result been? Um, it's, they've all been doing good. They've I mean, all been doing good. Exactly. Yeah. We've sold more timbers now because of those two models combined right, than right. even the original. Exactly. And the reason for that is because we're reaching a wider audience. So a guy like myself, I appreciated the original timber, and I definitely understood why people loved it, but I didn't own one. But then when the Timber X came out, I got one. Right. And when the Turbo Timber came out, I got one. Right. Because both of those had more power and uh, more aerobatic capability than the exactly. original, which got me interested. And it wasn't just me, it was a lot of other guys that I know that I fly with that are into aerobatics in particular. We love the idea of a timber, but at the same time, if it doesn't do a little bit more aerobatic wise, we're not interested. Exactly. And that's the point of this airplane, guys, is the intent to give you an airplane that looks a certain way, and we'll fly that way. You oh, can absolutely. fly this thing around as a cargo plane all you want, put the flaps down, cruise around, touch and goes, drop, open the door and close it many times, whatever you want to do. Um, but then at the same time, you can pour the coals on, right. and it's actually a pretty darn good 3D airplane. Absolutely. I mean, and that's the one thing, you know, even if you're just going to fly at scale, to know that you have the power if you yes. need it is always just a great thing. I mean, whether, whether you're never going to loop it or roll it, or if you're going to go out there and hover it, it, it right. kind of has that power you need regardless of how you fly it. Exactly, and, exactly. And that actually is going to make it possible to carry payloads exactly. in particular because we don't have to really worry too much about you know, uh, running out of power, being on the verge of not enough power to take off with it, you know, one pound, say two pound payload. And we'll talk a little bit more about those numbers here in a minute. Uh, but generally speaking, guys, the idea here was not to have a C-130 right. or a C-27 or any of those cargo aircraft that immediately come to mind when you see that. And those were inspiration for this model. Oh, absolutely. But they were not exactly what we modeled it after. And part of the reason for that is if we had made a super scale cargo airplane, it would have had a limited bandwidth. It just would have had a limited kind of market. Exactly. The guys who want to fly scale cargo, which I hate, there's guys out there like that. I'm one of those guys. I love the idea of a super scale cargo airplane. But at the same time, I may not have ponied up to buy one because after a couple flights, I know that I'd probably get a little bored with it. Right. So this, I won't get bored with. This, I can do all those things and enjoy the kind of look and feel of a cargo airplane that can do a whole lot more too. Absolutely. So yeah, I think it's really important guys that you understand the intent of this airplane was not to be a scale airplane and that's why we fly it the way that we do and that's why we gave it the capability that we did. Uh, and also I think it's kind of cool that it flies unexpected. Exactly. Yeah. You don't, when you look at it, everybody sees it on a table and they think, oh yeah, it's gonna fly this way and then you take off into a hover. They're like, what is going on? Right. It right. looks weird, we get it guys. It doesn't look right, you know, but at the same time, that's kind of the point. Neither right. does a, a, yeah, a timber doesn't look good hovering either right off the deck, but Exactly. or doesn't look right, but it can do it. So at any rate, guys, that's a lot of the reasons for the design the way it is. Uh, and then for that reason, we also then um, went with certain elements. For example, we don't have clear cockpit with um, you know the complication and weight associated with that, also the added expense of that. Exactly. And then uh, one point of contention that I know a lot of people brought up is retracts or the lack thereof. Right. And again, the point here is not to be a scale cargo airplane. Yeah. The point was to have an airplane that is uh, capable of more than a cargo airplane is, but at the same time, it's simple. Yeah. So it doesn't have the complexity of retracts, right, right, nor right. in some cases the fragile nature of retracts. Exactly. I mean, you know, a lot of guys may not have a nice paved runway to fly their right. scale airplane off of, whereas this thing can take off in just about anything. I mean, in the video, exactly. we're flying some really uh, tough, thick grass, and it just powers through it. So. You know, the guys who don't have that perfect runway can still fly this airplane and enjoy it. And enjoy it. Exactly. And I think that's important to, to keep in mind, guys, is that we didn't leave them out just because we didn't think it needed it. There were tangible reasons that we felt it would be better for a wider audience to have super rigid, simple landing gear yes. that was very, very durable, very robust. Uh, also, then it gave us the option to just have these real quick clip-on skis. Yep. And then we even have the ability to carry floats without having to lug around the extra weight of retracts. And right. so retracts added weight, cost, you know, would have been at least $7,500 more with retracts. And I know some guys are going to say, I'll gladly pay that. We understand that, but not everybody would. Right. In fact, the vast majority of people would not. And so for that reason, we kind of went with the design that we felt services the kind of the, the best overall uh, capabilities of the model. Right, so, right. you know, in this case, we got people who are going to fly it off the grass. <coughs> or, um, I think I've seen some guys talk about hand launching it. And, yeah. you know, we're actually going to try that here. We haven't really done that. But um, at the same time, I think you could easily remove the landing gear and probably belly land it. Yeah. To be honest, I think if you take the landing gear off, you probably could 
belly take off and land on grass. Possible. No problem. Yeah. So we might try that. You guys kind of inspired us with some of your questions and comments on that. We're gonna we're gonna play with it a little bit more here. We haven't done those things because we didn't really expect people to want to to do that per se. Um, but but we will. Uh, one of the other things I want to point out is the size. Yes. And um, I think that the standard in the industry today is to use the wingspan to categorize models. And that's really not always the best indicator of size and, or in this case, kind of girth, so right, to speak. Right. I mean, this is a large model. Although it's 1.5 meter wingspan, which is like a turbo timber, for example, exactly. or, uh, you know, a Concendo is a 1.5 meter airplane. Yeah. This is a whole lot bigger airplane. It's oh, yeah. a whole lot more airplane, guys. So if you kind of tip it up here, we can kind of see that the fuselage is huge, the cord of the wing is massive. Right. Uh, although the span, in order to kind of make it look like a traditional cargo airplane, is 1.5 meter, this model is really kind of a different class of, of aircraft. Yes. It's somewhere closer to you know a Carbon Z Cessna or Cub than it is to a even a Timber. Right. right. It's, it's, it's a couple pounds heavier. It's it's, it's using a larger battery pack. We've got basically almost like two Timber power systems in the thing. Exactly. The equivalent of that. And so that's what that's what we want guys to kind of see. Um, and kind of think about, and that's actually a part of the reason that we put this in our early access program, is we wanted it to be in the stores that participate in that program so they could see it firsthand. Exactly. So you can understand, wow, this is a big airplane. So go ahead and pick it up and hold it up kind of for everybody. You guys can see Matt's, I mean, it's, it's a whole lot of airplane. It is not small by any stretch. Um, and then at the same time, we wanted to make it more convenient, more practical to transport. So we've got some really cool features in there. Uh, so for example, we've got the hands-free connection in the wing, kind of a heavy duty version of that with a one big one plug. Uh, we've got plug-in stabs that I don't know that most guys are gonna remove those, but check this out. You push on a button and they pop right off. And so we've used this design on some other uh, aircraft over the years and we've got it on the stabs here and it works perfectly. Um, and that makes it really, really easy to transport uh, with the wings off and or the stabs off as well. So real quick back on the early access. So for those that don't know what that is, as you're seeing this video today, we just announced this last Thursday. On Thursday, uh, some of the stores that are in our network that participate in that program actually got one of these in the store and they have it on display. Some of them even went out and flew it this weekend. I believe so, yeah. uh, and so you can see it right now. You have to go to our website, use the dealer locator. Uh, and this is in the US at the moment only, guys. Um, but check that dealer locator, uh, put in your zip code, see if you've got one of the early access dealers for the air side of things. You have to yeah. put early access air. You have to go to the advanced options and select that. And then you can see if someone's got it. And if they do, you can go and see that this week. Yep. Even Absolutely. before it's shipping even before it's in everybody else's hands so uh, that does lead me to the point of this is going to be available um, next week yes so these are already on the way to us they will be shipping out as soon as the end of this week if not you know uh, early next week in the US and then in Europe not far after that only about a week behind that so, yeah. so um, that's very exciting we're announcing it and showing it to you guys and then also it's going to be almost immediately available and uh, that's a point to make that in the past we have had times where we go a couple weeks to a couple months between announcement and release. Sometimes that's strategic or right, right. or kind of uh, because we've got a big show coming up like Joe Nall. You know, we showed exactly. off the, the Carbon Z Cub, even though it wasn't gonna be out for a couple months, we wanted people to know we got a big giant scale airplane again and that's the yeah. perfect place to do it. Right, so right, right. Um, this though, we have kind of been teasing a little bit here or there. Uh, we've been working on it for so long and we're so excited about it that it was really hard to keep it under wraps. And yeah. so we did show it off at uh, uh, an event with our uh, bigger partners um, a couple months ago. Uh, and so that was, a, I think it was a big hit. Everybody saw it, they're like, wow, this is awesome. Now I did hear a couple people say, oh, that C-130 is great. Yeah. Or that C-27 or whatever it is, is great. Again, it's not that, it's inspired by those things. Uh, and the trim scheme comes from, if I'm not mistaken, a C-27. Uh, this particular trim scheme is actually a commemorative, commemorative scheme on a C-130. That's right, so. that's right. Yeah, it's inspired by, so it is a scale scheme, guys, because some guys have asked that, or scale inspired. Yeah. We yeah. can't say it's a scale scheme, it's not a scale airplane. It's a scale inspired airplane yes. with a scale inspired trim scheme. Uh, so again, it will be available as soon as next week. You can pre-order it today at your favorite local hobby shop, your favorite online hobby shop, horizonhobby.com. Uh, it is available in two versions. We've got the buy and fly basic version, uh, and then we also have the plug and play version. Both are identical. They have the power systems installed. You've got you know twin brushless motors. You've got the ESCs, two ESCs. You've got counter rotating props. Yep. Uh, you've got metal geared servos. This is what total of nine servos? Uh, yes. Yep. Nine servos total. We've got metal geared servos pretty much everywhere except I think on the nose gear. Correct. Yeah. That one's got its own servo, so it doesn't it doesn't have metal gears on that one. We've got counter rotating props, by the way, guys. Yep. Uh, for those that haven't noticed that, which makes it track perfectly straight. You punch a throttle, it just goes. Yep. Makes it even easier to hover because you don't have that that torque effect. Yeah, it's it just 
as you slow down and get into a hover, there's just no yaw or no weird torque or P factor you're feeling. Just it just locks you straight in. I'm telling you guys, you will be surprised. For the guys that want to fly 3D or haven't even really tried 3D but can hover, you'll be blown away by how this thing does it. Uh, and then something else we have, we have a separate VEC in here. Yes. Yep. And the reason we put that in there is we do have a lot of servos. Uh, and we've got extreme throw potential. Yes. And so if you've got this thing, like that flat spin that you performed, where you've got you know, the surfaces maxed out, you got the elevator maxed, you got the, the ailerons maxed out, I bet that was putting a lot of load on the BEC. Right, right. And so for that reason, we've got a separate BEC in there kind of for uh, extra reliability, extra insurance, and, and all these things kind of add up into the price. And, uh, you know, and I'll admit that unfortunately these days things keep getting more expensive and so we do a ground up design like this it's costing more money not only in the development time but really more in the mold costs and then the production costs the labor costs there's a lot of work that goes into putting this airplane together at the factory that I don't think a lot of people realize and so this airplane is coming out of the box uh, very much pre-finished um, and so you know they've done everything they've put the power systems in for you they've got all the hinges and this has real hinges too it's not like foam hinge lines that are going to potentially break we've got a combination of pocket hinges I believe and yep. some CA hinges, hinges. And then the, the entire tail surfaces are all CA hinges so all those things are a lot of work if you've built an airplane before guys you know how much work it is putting hinges and it's not a fun thing to do so real quick the Minafly basic version is available for $399.99 so $400 approximately US uh, the plug and play version is about $30 cheaper yep. Those come with everything the same. The plug and play version is $369.99, so $370 US because it doesn't have the AR636 receiver. And so the AR636 receiver on the Binafly basic version does have AS3X, yes. which smooths things out, it doesn't fly the airplane for you, it doesn't get in your way. Uh, and then it also has optional use safe select. Correct. And safe select, I know a lot of experienced guys say, I don't need that, I don't want that, I don't know why you guys keep putting that in airplanes. It's selectable for a reason. Yep. You don't have to use it. I always bind with it on and I put it on a switch so I have it. And the benefits are with safe select, you've got the bank angle limits and pitch angle limits. Uh, and you also uh, have self leveling. So when you exactly. let go of the stick, it goes back to level. And that's great for. Uh, Dropping cargo, yep. for example. Flip on the switch, and instead of having to focus on keeping the airplane on online, you can just open the door at the right moment. Exactly. Instead of having to fly all the other surfaces. That's one tangible benefit. Other things, if you fly through the sun, lose orientation, flip on safe, put the stick in the corner, and the thing will make a nice circuit for yes. you. Uh, you can hand it off to a less experienced pilot. Or let's say it's really bad crosswind that day. Yeah. You can cheat. You turn on safe. It keeps the wings level for you. You might have to use a little bit of a rudder to kind of keep the, the thing kind of you know on track on the runway, but it makes your life a lot easier. So there are reasons for it. Now, you know, some guys have argued, well, you put safe and everything so beginners can fly it. No, this is not a beginner airplane. This airplane is not intended for someone who's never flown radio controlled aircraft before. It could definitely be maybe a second airplane, but definitely like a third airplane. Yeah. So if you've flown something like uh, you know the E-Flight Apprentice or the Hobby Zone Carbon Cub S Plus or the recently released Aero Scout. When you're ready to move on from those models, you could potentially jump into this. I don't know that I personally would recommend that because uh, there's some, it's not hard to fly. And I would say that generally speaking, it's pretty simple to handle, but with the narrow landing gear and things like that and crosswinds, it could take a little bit more control, a little bit more work than they might be used to yet. Right. And so for that reason, I'd say, you know, good second or a good third airplane, more than a second airplane. If you want any low wing type airplane, like a Warbird or, yeah. you know, or an EDF, which is very popular right now, you can easily fly this airplane, guys. And so uh, we do classify it as a skill level two, which is some experience required. Uh, it's easier to fly with AS3X and Safe Select, uh, or optionally use Safe Select in there. So the Binafly might be good for those guys. So uh, real quick on the Binafly basic version, it's six channels. Yes. So what are all the six channels? So you have your basic uh, main controls, you know, throttle, rudder, elevator, ailerons. Uh, you also have flaps and then yep. the uh, do rear door. The door, that's right. Yeah, so we don't have retracts, guys. We've got the door that takes up channel five. So your gear channel becomes your, your door channel, which in a lot of spectrum transmitters in particular, you can assign that to whatever switch you want. Um, but that's a, a benefit of using the um, not having retracts is, yeah. is we've got the six channels. That's all we needed uh, to get the job done. So if you have a six channel transmitter, DX, you know, 6E, great. You can take, take care of pretty much everything. There is one caveat though. If you buy the Binafly basic version and you want to use safe select yes. and the door and the flaps, yeah. You're gonna either have to, well, you're gonna have, have to, to give up one of those. Yes. So you're not gonna be able to put safe select on a switch unless you have a seventh channel or more. That's yep. why we say six to seven plus channel radio. Uh, potentially, let's say, I wouldn't not use the flaps because, you know, if you don't fix those, um, they might move around in yep. flight if they're unpowered, if you unplug them from the receiver and use that channel for safe select. So my suggestion would be if you need safe select and you only have a six channel transmitter, I would probably unplug the door yep. and then assign safe select to your gear channel. 
And so then you have safe select on a switch. You won't be able to use the cargo door, but of course you're not gonna use the cargo door often anyway. And then maybe once you get familiar with the airplane, you can bind it without safe select and put the door back in. Yes. So that's an option as well. So, uh, but that said, you know, a lot of guys are probably gonna want to go with uh, an eight channel transmitter because then they have the option to have safe select on a seven, seventh channel. Uh, so it's separated from the rest of the functions. Then you've got your flaps, you've got your door, you can do everything. So that's my shameless plug, guys. If you have a six channel transmitter, now's the time to upgrade to an eight channel transmitter. That's exactly why we made this DX8E to make it more affordable to get those extra channels. We've got more and more airplanes coming with more and more functions, more and more features. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if you know, seven channels is the new six, and then the next thing you know, eight channels is the new six. So when you can upgrade, especially if you have a DX6i, I still see a lot of those out there. It's time to upgrade, guys. You know, all of our, our new Gen 2 transmitters or the e-transmitters here in particular uses the new Airware software, yep. and it's super easy because you can share models back and forth. We can provide model files for you to download from our website. Uh, it's super easy to set up transmitters when you have those. So again, uh, DX6E will get the job done, or six channel radio will get the job done. Seven or eight channels better, yes. especially for the bind and fly basic version. And then if you're an experienced pilot and you want to do all the crazy mixing that you could potentially do with this, you've got four servos in the wing. We've got two aileron and two flap servos. Right now in the Bind and Fly Basic version, they're Y harness. Yes. Even in the plug and play, they're Y harness coming out of the box. Yeah. So that way um, it just keeps it simple. You don't use many channels. But if you unplug that, and let's say you have an eight channel, nine channel receiver, um, you can do a lot of cool things. Yeah. So you can plug the ailerons in separate channels. Yep. Flaps in separate cha separate channels. Yes. And then you can have crow. Yeah. You can have full span ailerons. Right. And that actually makes it roll a little bit faster. I mean, you can see this particular version as it comes out of the box has the yeah. large aileron, um, but full span you can get quite a bit more roll rate because yep. you got so much more aileron in the prop blast. So for those that haven't seen this yet, it is hinged so the flaps go both ways. Now, out of the box, it does come that way, but you would have to have the additional channels to separate your flap channels in particular. It's a minimum of seven channels, yes. but for a lot of guys, they probably use an eight or nine channel receiver to separate those out. You don't need to do that, and one thing we want to show you is that out of the box, you can configure it. You Basically, you can see here, we've got almost three surfaces on the wing. We've got a flap, we've got kind of a middle surface, which can be a flap or an aileron, yep. and then we've got an aileron. And you have the option out of the box to conjoin this middle uh, section to either the flaps or to the aileron. So this airplane here, as Matt showed you, we've got basically the middle part attached to the aileron. Yes. There's a little joiner that's included in the box. Uh, on this one, we have it the other way around. So we actually have the smaller aileron, the larger flap. So for guys that are primarily flying, you know, maybe just cargo missions or sport flying or not into a lot of aggressive 3D aerobatics and things, this setup will probably work well for Oh, absolutely. They yeah, got a bigger definitely flaps. a more scale kind of setup uh, for flying. You know, the tunes down the roll rate a little bit uh, and definitely the larger flap area allow you to come in slower, yeah. uh, do a little bit more kind of short takeoff and the stuff landing kind of kind of situations. So. so that is, it comes that way out of the box and you can move that joiner or you can for, change the joiner yes, out. Yes. So you can do it on the fly. You're not, yeah. per, it's not a permanent thing that no, you have to No, I mean, choose. it's a couple minutes at the field and you can swap from the small aileron to the large aileron or vice versa. Yeah, and so with the large aileron, it rolls quite well. Yep. And then obviously, again, if you have a higher channel count receiver, you can do the potentially full span aileron there and get even more throw. Yep. Uh, for a guy who's flying aggressive 3D, they may want that. Yep. But to be honest, I've flown it with just the, the six channel configuration with the large aileron and it rolled quite well. Yeah. I it rolls better with this, yes. but. And again, you do have you know almost half the prop blast on your aileron with the large aileron here. So even in a hover, you still have the ability still to have control that, yeah. the roll. So. But the beauty again is with counter rotating props, you don't have to counter that that torque effect that you get from a single prop airplane. Exactly. So um, yeah, really cool. So the wings are, are you know are really awesome, guys. Again, we've got the heavy duty hands free connection system here. We've got metal geared servos all around. We've got ball links on both sides of the linkages, so you guys can see that here. Both sides have the ball links. Um, you know, all these little things kind of start to add up to the yeah, price, right. and that's kind of how it gets to where it gets to. Uh, we also have thumb screws. Yes. So, so putting the wings on and off of the field is just a couple minutes, no tools. Yep. Beautiful. And the stabs, we showed that. You can pop them in, pop them out. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing how quickly you can assemble this once you get out of the box, and also how quickly you can break it down for uh, transport and storage. Right. And so. for such a big airplane, it is surprisingly easy to transport. Yes. I've actually been able to fit two of these in a fairly small pickup truck. Yep. You know, take the stabs and wings off. You can sit the two fuselage in the front seat, wings in the back. No problem. Exactly. So. so even though it's a relatively large model, it's easy to transport. Yes. And so let's talk about some of the other cool features that it's got. So we've got uh, lights. Yes. So I think we could actually plug it in, right? Yep. And kind of show people that. Let's do that. And I'd say these days, lights are becoming kind of more and more an expectation, not just on scale aircraft, but even on semi-scale aircraft like this or the, um, the timber, for example, all very, very popular. 
So you guys can hear two ESCs arming there with uh, brushless twins. You have to have separate ESCs. And you guys can see the lights. Uh, we've got a combination of lights here. We've got um, the navigation lights on the tips. We also have landing lights here on the leading edge. We've got a beacon on the top there. We've got a light in the tail. You may not be able to see all those right now, uh, but it does kind of have that full complement of semi-scale lights. Exactly. Uh, almost like a full-scale model would have. It's not intended to fly at night. Not, not intended intentionally. Right. So I mean, you know, dusk, early morning, uh, that usually when the lights really show up well. Um, you know, the landing lights are quite bright on final. You see them makes good for orientation. It does. Even in those low light situations. So that makes kind of gives you the option to fly a little earlier, a little later. Yeah. So it gives you uh, kind of more versatility. Again, that's the big thing about this airplane. More capability and more versatility <laughs> than almost any airplane we've ever offered before. Uh, you know, dare we say the Swiss Army knife of airplanes? Right. It right. can do all kinds of things. And so the lights, I think, are a really great addition. I love the looks of the props. Uh, I think most people agree that the props really kind of set this thing off. It makes Absolutely. it look very modern because you've got the turboprop styling, um, but then also kind of the just cool, unique look. Yeah, yeah. I haven't had a plane with a five-blade prop yet, so <coughs> I'm really excited to have one here, and I think a lot of people are going to appreciate that. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, you guys can see here that um, it's, again, large airplane, and you saw the hatch here, which I love that you've got these kind of built-in... Um, hard points here yes. on the back of the hatch so it's easy to pop it on and off. It's magnetically secured. You guys can see the hatch is huge. Yeah, and you got these nice little indentations right here, the plastic reinforcements, so you're not going to be denting the foam and, yep. and dinging up your hatch, just taking it on and off. And then we purposely are eliminating the paint in those areas where you handle it so you exactly. don't kind of bump the paint off over time. And so, real cool thing on the hatch is you can pop this little top piece off. If you want to pull a little FPV camera up here, you can. Yep. Uh, you can also pull the nose cone off. Put an FPV camera, or actually, sorry, not an FPV camera, but like a GoPro or an action cam. Yep. You can stick it in the nose so you can record your flight. So you can have both. You can have the action cam in there recording your flight. You can have the FPV camera up front so you can see what basically that camera is seeing. Uh, you can also put other things in there. So for example, nose weight. Yeah, exactly. When you're carrying cargo, if you need to counteract that, or let's say you're using a smaller battery, um, all of those kind of are options now that you've got this easy to remove nose cone. And so let's tip it up and show them inside the battery compartment because this thing has gobs of space. Look at all that space in there. So we got a 4S 5000 milliamp battery in there and there's still tons of room. Yeah, you can probably fit at least another one or two of those batteries in there, no problem. Yeah, so you guys can see you got a lot going on in there. We've got the nose gear steering servo. We have the separate BEC in there. We have the AR636 receiver in there. And basically it comes down to, you can put almost any combination of batteries in here exactly. that you can think of. We designed this, in, we didn't want this to be a 6S airplane because not everybody has 6S batteries. That's becoming a little more common, especially with the <coughs> mid-size EDS now. Uh, but I think one consideration that we always have is making sure people can use batteries they may not already have. Right. Now, a 4S5000 isn't a super common battery. It's not a completely uncommon battery, right. but not a lot of us own those. A lot of us have 6S5000s, and a lot of us have, let's show over here, obviously three cell 2200s, four cell 2200s now are very common. And so what's really cool is you can easily just take two three cell 2100s and put them in parallel as a three cell 4400 milliamp battery. Yep, perfect fit in this airplane. Exactly. More than enough room to do that. And so uh, same thing with the 4S 2200s, you can install those with a Y harness, which I'll show you here in a second, parallel Y harness. So you can join those together and have four cell 4400. So again, the beauty is you've got 3S and 4S capability, just like a lot of E-Flight airplanes. On 3S, it's got good power. Yeah, it'd probably, if you're gonna do the scale cargo missions, I would say stay in 3S. If you're not looking for that ballistic, crazy vertical climb power, 3S exactly. will, will work fine for you. Exactly. So with the 4S setup, you've got unlimited vertical. Yes. Oh, with, with no, no payload, payload. of right, course. Right. So you had a couple pounds of payload and you, and you might not have that, but you've got ridiculous power on four cells. And so we specifically set it up so you can install three or four and you don't have to change anything. Nope, it's all auto detect and everything. Perfect, so no prop changes, no motor changes, no upgrades, no modifications, that's beautiful. And so again, you can take Let's just take these two uh, four cell batteries here, for example, that have IC3s on them, which is this, it's uh, equivalent to our uh, EC3 connector, but our smart batteries come equipped with these because they have the extra pin in the middle. And so if you take those two and you put in a parallel Y harness, now basically as I can join them, I've got a four cell 4400 milliamp battery. That's what I've got now. And so that's a perfect setup for an airplane like this. You can easily fit that in there all day long. The only difference is that the airplane does have an ESC equipped with an EC5 connector. And that EC5 connector is compatible with the IC5 connector that you guys saw plugged in here from the 4S5000, uh, but you would then need an adapter. So you put this adapter in, so you've got EC5 down to EC3, and then you can plug in your parallel Y harness. So uh, I know a lot of guys are gonna say, oh my gosh, that's so many connections, you, ca you can't do that, you shouldn't do that, guys, it's fine. We've done it, you can do it. Yeah. It's not ideal, sure, you don't get every 
little bit of power, you know, you're gonna have a little bit more voltage loss, maybe a little bit uh, less efficiency in it, but it works just fine, guys. So if you don't wanna have to buy new batteries, solder up IC5 or EC5 connectors on your battery, you can easily buy pre-made wire harnesses, a pre-made adapter, and install, again, three cell, four cell, 2200 is a great choice. A lot of guys probably have three cell 3200s yep. or four cell 3200s yep. from various airplanes. You can easily put those in parallel too as 6400 milliamps. So we kind of recommend that. We say anywhere from a 3200 up to a, a 6400 milliamp battery, and that's where we're getting 64s. We're taking two 32s putting them in parallel is 64 and either flying those again as 3S or 4S. But I will then say that, you know, the battery that we recommend, if you want to buy a really great battery for this application, we've got these brand new 4S 5000 uh, 30C Spectrum Smart Batteries. Yep. And it's a great, that's what you're flying in here now. It's got long flight times. It's a nice one simple pack. Uh, we'll probably have more airplanes down the road that use these batteries. And so I think that if you're looking for a brand new battery solution, this is a great one to go with. 5000 milliamp is, a good kind of middle road. Yeah. You know, it's not the 6400 setup, it's not quite the 4400 setup, uh, but it gets really good flight time. So with this 4S5000, I think you were saying you get five to six minutes of 3D flying? Yeah, and you know, when I've landed, there's been plenty of battery left in it. You know, I try not to fly any twins to low voltage cutoff, because right. if one motor does cut, and you're not ready for it, you're down low doing something crazy, you might not have the altitude to recover. So definitely yes. make sure you set a timer, make sure you check what's going back in the battery after your flights, and that'll right. really give you the, the measure of how what kind of flying you're doing, what kind of flight times you can expect out of it. Yeah, I think but that's the important thing to point out about flight times is it varies. It yeah. varies depending on your flying style, the performance of your battery, yeah. the conditions you're flying, and if it's windy, you're using more throttle, Absolutely. so you're gonna get less flight time. But generally speaking, on a 4S5000, we're looking at five to six minutes of aggressive 3D flying, probably 10 to 15 minutes of slow throttle back yeah. cruise flying. Yeah. And so again, it could be five to 15 minutes depending on your battery. With a 4400 setup, you're probably gonna get just a little less than that. Right. You know, maybe like 30 to 40 seconds less than those numbers. Um, so a 4400 setup is great. 6400 setups, of course, gonna give you a little bit more. You could probably shove an 8000 in there if you want to. Probably, yeah, there's definitely the room for it. The only- Two of these. Be, yeah, <laughs> just make sure you got uh, your CG in the right spot and it should be yes. fine. Let's point that out really quick. So CG is important always on an airplane. The reason we recommend those 32 200s and 6400s is those pretty much work without having to change right. weight. You can slide it forward and back on the tray. If you were to need to add nose weight because you're using a smaller battery, pop the nose cone off, slide some weight in the front exactly. and go. Uh, and then that brings me to the point of cargo bay. Yeah. And so let's talk about that. A lot of guys are excited. This has a cargo bay. It has a functional cargo door with yep. a metal geared servo that you can open and close during flight, uh, which makes it a lot of fun because there's gonna be some cool things you can do with it. Yep. And so the cargo bay, we put the dimensions uh, in our um, information on our website so you can kind of see how big the door is and then how big the space is that you have. The vast majority of um, the compartment is pretty much right here in the center around the, the wing. Yeah. And so uh, some of it's ahead of the CG, some of it's behind the CG. Um, and in the video, if you guys have watched that, that was a die cast metal car yeah. that you had, you pretty much put it on the door. Yes, and then we also had a run cam mounted on top of that. Uh, run too. cam on top of that. So you know, many ounces, uh, uh, probably a half pound at least, yeah. sitting on the door. And you had the 4S5000 in there. Yep. And uh, you did add a little bit of nose weight to make sure that your CG was still spot on. Uh, and the reason you put it on the door is so as soon as it came out, as soon as the door opened, you didn't even really have to pull the nose up. Exactly. It just kind of just came out. Right out. Yeah, and that's why you guys see that sequence where it's basically flying level, the parachute pulls the plane out. We got that by putting it on the door. Now, if you put the cargo further into the compartment where it's not gonna affect the CG as much, uh, you might have to pull the nose up to drop it out. Or, which I think is cool, you can hover, doo -doo -doo, then open the door, <laughs> and then drop it out. So you can hover right over a target and then drop it right on it. So, you know, if you guys have like a spot drop contest at your fun flies, you can probably cheat with us. Just hover right over the spot, drop it immediately. Um, and we do but, have a couple uh, options to oh, drop right. it. Yeah, we yeah. have the EFLA 510 and 530. There's uh, basically a pack of three little parachute guys and a pack of four little streamer rockets. So. That'd be fun to drop. The streamer yes. rockets would be ideal for spot spot drops. So we've got those available, readily available. And then at the same time, you can see in the video, we bought some die cast yep, yep. cars and we bought all kinds of just other things to drop out of there. Guys are talking about dropping flower sacks, water balloons. Those things all probably will work. You just yep. have to mind your CG, yep. know that you may end up having to add a little bit of nose weight on takeoff. 
um, to be able to uh, bounce correctly. But then, of course, after you drop the payload, you might be a little nose heavy, but that's fine. Yeah. You know, it might just take a little more up elevator uh, on approach or something like that. Not a big deal. Um, we're, we haven't really flown this as heavily loaded as possible. I mean, you could shove literally a, a brick in this thing. Probably, yeah. And fly it. And so we don't officially recommend putting five to 10 pounds of payload in it. Um, we say, you know, one to two pounds of payload is probably about the max that most people comfortably can put in here and not really have a negative impact on flight performance. Uh, obviously, with uh, that much weight, you will need a little more power. Um, 3S could work for us, probably better for a lot of guys. So there's going to be a lot of experimentation, I think, with Absolutely. payloads, weight-wise, size-wise, how to drop them. Yep. You know, you can't just open the door and expect it to come out. Right. It's not always going to happen. So sometimes you got to use gravity to your advantage to uh, kind of slide it out, drop it out. Um, but there's going to be a lot of fun things people can do with the cargo bay. We know that. Everybody just be sure to mind your CG. Yep. Um, we purposely put it as, as much under the wing as possible, so it didn't have that much of an impact on the CG, but there is still some impact. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind there. So can we turn it around and show guys the door Absolutely. and the opening? In fact, I think this is our first airplane with a cargo door, right? I believe you're right. We've had different things that could drop in the past, but this actually has a functional door. So again, it is attached to a servo, which is plugged into channel five and the buy and fly basic version, you can plug it into whatever channel on, on other airplanes. And you've got it set up so it's not touching the ground. Correct. So you can potentially, um, I guess, open it on the ground. You wouldn't necessarily want to take off and land with it open. Right, right. But uh, in the air, it's not hanging down and there's not a ton of load on it uh, aerodynamically. But we do have the Metal Gear exactly. Servo in there just to be safe. Yep. And then you guys can kind of see it's uh, a fair, fair sized space in there, all the way down in there. There's some streamer rockets in there now. Are there? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, there they are. <laughs> That's where they went. We were wondering where they went. So, uh, yeah, you've got that on a, a channel. Basically, I think it's like zero travel, 100% travel, and it's open and it's closed. Yeah, you just set it so it's not binding when it's up, and then you can basically right. set it as far down as you kind of want it to, depending on your travel you set up on your gear. So it makes right. it easy. You can, you can have it go down this far or even a little bit further. Even a little further, want, okay. But, uh, I tended to make it just so I had that little bit of ground clearance so I wasn't scraping the door. Yeah. The other cool thing about that is if you look just on the bottom here, the door hinge is plastic, and yeah. that's what's actually going to hit the ground as you that's rotate. Right. So it's not going to damage the foam of the door if you over rotate or land with a little bit more high, higher angle of attack. So yes. that's just kind of a nice little safety skid feature built in, so you're not just tearing up your airplane every time you take yeah. off. Yeah, so that, that's, a, a, that's a nice touch. Those hard points on the on the hatch are great. You've got some hard points back here where kind of the wing root goes into the flap there. Exactly. That's, that's a nice touch point. because you're not going to have little chunks of foam breaking off there. So and there's a lot of great other things to this. So when you get it out of the box, there's no glue involved. There's zero gluing guys. Right. Um, the, the stabs you saw, they snap into place. The hands-free connections with the thumb screws on the wing makes that easy to install. The vertical, you have to install a couple of bolts. Super simple. Yep. Nothing difficult to do. Uh, how long would you say to get it together? 10 minutes at best. Minutes. I mean, I would say yeah. getting it out of the box is probably going to take longer than physically assembling it. The, uh, the one thing you do have to do is install the, the collets and, and uh, spinners yeah. and props. Yeah. Um, and that is something because of the large diameter and mass of these things, Make sure that your collet is nice and tight. Uh, we've yeah. actually spit a couple of these. If, if you don't tighten it down, so make sure it's nice and cinched, just because yeah. there is a lot of rotational mass here, especially when you're doing 3D stuff. Yes. Um, but the, the props are extremely strong and rigid. You can see they're just mm -hmm. very stout props. They're a one-piece prop. So, I mean, even if you tip it up and happen to nick it on the ground, it seems to be pretty durable. I yeah. Have not broken just chips the tip from normal yeah. flying. So. Yeah. So I think some guys will probably figure out how to, how to break them. <laughs> um, but generally speaking, you won't, but it's a good, great advice to make sure you cinch them down tight. Because I know I've seen guys out flying, especially hovering, and then pff, their prop's gone. Yeah. Because they didn't have it tightened down on the collet enough. So make sure you watch out for that. Um, other than that, there's really nothing difficult about assembling it. And then again, it's easy to break down and transport. And then we've got some gear options. We've got fixed landing gear in the bottom, which is really sol solid landing gear. Yes. Um, it's got really good uh, kind of uh, depth on the wheels. So the wheels are not completely sunk into the fuselage. Fresh. They're you know, beyond the halfway point, so the axle is actually below the fuselage, which gives us better ground clearance so we can fly off of grass. And you guys can see in the video, the grass that we're flying off is pretty tall. And we Probably. actually went to the thickest part of the grass at our ah, field right. intentionally to show off what it can do. So, so it, can, it can do that. It can taxi through it, has the power to take off out of it, Absolutely. and it lands on it just fine. So uh, something else that's cool is in the box, we put some skis. 
So, um, you know, it's not a great time of year for us to, to try. <laughs> you know, it's too bad it's not six months ago and it seemed like every day it was snowing oh, or something else. Uh, but this winter we're going to have a lot of fun with these. The skis are cool because they just snap on over the axles that are already there. You don't have to remove the wheels. Correct. You just snap it over and you go. And then uh, on top of that, we also have the option for floats. So some guys might recognize these. These are our 15 size floats, yep. which uh, we've used on the Apprentice 15 for many years, Apprentice STS now, uh, and some other you know, similar size models, 15 size models. And uh, we do have the hardware to mount the floats. You can see it here, comes with the airplane. Correct. So you don't have to buy hardware separately. There is one additional package you do purchase, which is basically a second set of these straight rods. Oh, ah, okay. Because the original Apprentice floats have the, oh, large, the taller right. fit the fuselage, and it will come with this correct length push rod. Other than that, everything else. Oh, I so see. Okay. If, I mean, if you wanted to, you could probably put the floats on without these double rods, and it would work, and then just go buy a push rod at your local hard, yeah. hard hobby store. But we will have a set that's built specifically for this airplane. Um, one other small note about the floats, the front screws that come with it, we found out we're a little short. Oh, yeah. Uh, they, really they ended up being about yeah. 20 millimeters. They need to be about 30. So yeah. you find yourself a number two by one and a quarter, or if you're in Europe, a, a metric two by 30 screw. Yeah. The plywood plate is in the bottom. It's just the screws that were included were not quite long enough. We are adjusting that on future runs, but just for this initial run, just watch out for that. You just need a longer screw to mount yeah. the front mount. And then uh, that's it. There's nothing complicated about mounting these. They're easy to take on and off then. Like this set, which we've used a couple times now, we actually have the option to basically just swap it within five, 10 minutes. Yeah, basically it's, it's four screws per pad. And like I said, they go right into um, a plywood plate that's inside the fuselage. There's actually little recesses so you can, don't get it in the wrong spot. And you just thread the screws in until they grab the wood and you're good to go. Ah, it's a, it's a nice low cool. profile float mount, so it's pretty rigid on the airplane. Yeah, and it looks, it's, it's kind of interesting looking. I know it some is. guys are like, I dig the way it looks. Some guys are like, I don't know, it doesn't look right. But uh, I actually saw a picture somebody posted of a C-130 with floats on it. Did you see this? I did. I think that's and a it Photoshop. Looked, but, oh, uh, is it Photoshop? <laughs> oh, I was going to say, I, I thought it didn't seem real, but it, be, it actually didn't look bad. Yeah. And now it makes me think it's maybe not um, so odd looking. But, you know, that said, it's not going to be for everyone and not everyone's going to fly it off of floats, but we wanted to have that capability and that versatility. So you can do anything you want. Fly off of paved runway, grass, dirt, uh, other rough surfaces probably, gravel and things like that. You'll be able to fly off of snow. You'll be able to fly off of water. Yep. There's not a lot of airplanes we've offered that have that much right, capability. Right. And then on top of that, being able to fly semi-scale or scale-like and then uh, do aerobatics, basic aerobatics, loops and rolls, no problem, inverted flight, no problem, and then 3D on top of that. Yeah. There's not a lot of models that are that versatile. And I think that's really impressive um, to have one airplane that can do all those things. And it's a twin. Yes. And it looks like a cargo plane. Right. And it has lights. Uh, there's just, there's a lot to this airplane, guys. And I think um, it's important for us to kind of show you all these things because I think it's easy to just look at it and form an opinion. Yeah. It should be this. It should be that. You know, and of course, the world today, um, everything can identify as it wants to identify. So, you know, this airplane can be flown as a cargo airplane. It can be flown as a 3D airplane. It doesn't have to be one or the other or both. Um, you can do it however you want. You know, we want to see guys out there flying them scale like. We want to see guys out there dropping payloads. We want to see guys hovering them down on the deck. And I think we're going to see a lot of these in a lot of fields yeah. when guys start to realize just how wide of an envelope it has exactly. and how whether you're into simple flying or aggressive flying, it can do all those things. It's just, there's not a lot of airplanes that can do that. And you can do both of them on the same flight. You know, you take off gentle on yes. scale, drop something, and go wild and crazy and do some 3D. I mean, it's, you're not limited by what you know, what, kind, what this airplane can do, it, it can kind of do it all. I mean, all exactly. the surfaces, all the types of flying you want to do, it's, it's a very versatile airplane. And it, you know, if you want to fly it, like you said, nice and slow, it can do that all day long. Exactly. And I'm looking forward to flying it that way. I'm planning on doing, you know, a combination of both. I'll have my low rates, flip it down, put the flaps down, and just drag the thing around. Exactly. Um, and then at the same, and doing touch and goes. Of course. I think I'm going to love doing touch and goes with this airplane. Uh, but then on top of that, being able to take off and put, go into a hover, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. I am really looking forward to getting my hands on one. So again, guys, you guys are watching this video today live. Uh, we'll post this on YouTube a little later on, um, but these will be available roughly the middle of August in the US, maybe about a week later in the UK and EU. Uh, and that's really exciting because it's short time between official announcement and actual shipping time. You can pre-order it today. And to be honest, they're selling really fast and there's a possibility we'll sell out of the first shipment. Uh, a lot of times we run out of these first shipments and um, if we do that, you might be having to wait for a month or two yeah. before you get your hands on one. So make sure you're pre-order today. It's your favorite local hobby shop, your favorite online retailer, or horizonhobby.com. Again, the Bind and Fly Basic version is available for $399.99, so $400 US in the US Canada. Uh, and then also the plug and play version, about $30 cheaper, $369.99. 
Um, so three hundred seventy dollars US without the everything the same, just yep. no receiver. Correct. So have we got any questions that have come up? Yeah. So some of the guys that are just joining actually want to see the cargo door again. Okay. And I want to see a close up of it if possible. Ah, okay. So the question was, can we see a close up of the cargo door again? Uh, I know a lot of guys are going to be interested in that. So Matt's going to turn it on here. We'll show you a close up of that. And again, if you've got one of a, if you've got a local hobby shop, make sure check and make sure that they might be they might be a part of our early access program, and then you can go and see this thing in person, uh, so you can see that cargo bay for yourself. But it's pretty large. I'm gonna probably show you it with, relative to a battery here. So here's the you know 4S5000 battery. You can fit it in there all day long. You guys can kind of see how much space you've got there. It's it's a lot of space. So we've got those dimensions on our website. We've got the dimensions for the door and we have the dimensions for the cargo bay itself. And obviously the door dictates how much you can let out right. and put in easily. Uh, but there is some extra space inside there um, in case you had some, you know, different kinds of payloads like candy. You know, you can exactly. shove that thing, you can probably stuff that whole thing full of candy, the door open, it'll all come out at some point. Right, right, right. Uh, I suspect I see, a, I'm gonna see a lot of candy drops. I, I'm guessing we're gonna see a lot of that, a lot of parachute guys, yep. a lot of parachute things. Exactly. Just putting a parachute on anything is fun. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions that have come up? If you had to guess how much weight it could hold. So, we haven't maxed it out. Uh, the intent wasn't to necessarily um, fly it as heavily loaded as possible and give you guys that because the heavier it gets, obviously the more negative impact it has on flight performance. So we're officially saying one to two pounds should be fine. Yep. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if some guys fly more, um, but we haven't maxed it out. We have not. It's got tons of power on 4S. Uh, yeah. It's got unlimited vertical, so it's got more than one to one thrust to weight ratio. So even with a couple of pounds of payload, it's still got very good performance right. on even 3S, it'll probably fly and, and 4S, no problem. Exactly. Yeah, any other questions? That's it. All right, well, thank you guys. Uh, I think this covers pretty much everything that we wanted to show. Um, I think the biggest things to remember are there's a whole lot of stuff going on in this airplane that I don't think a lot of people realize by looking at it. Uh, again, those details like the real hinges. We've got pocket hinges, CA hinges, metal geared servos all the way around, ball links on both ends of the linkages, separate BEC, twin power systems with brushless motors, brushless ESCs, um, pretty much everything that you can think of. We've addressed it here. We've got the lights. Uh, we've got the option for floats, we've got the skis included in the box, um, got the ability to run cameras, yep. and then more than anything is the size. It's yep. bigger than you think it is. It presents much, much bigger than just the wingspan alone. Right. And it's, you know, there's like the little touches, like you mentioned the hatch reinforcement, easy yes. to get that off, you know, the <clears throat> trailing edge reinforcement, the little things, the stab removal that makes it so easy, the wing removal makes it so easy. Yep. All those things just make this a really fun airplane that's easy to get to the field, easy to have a lot of fun with, and easy to basically fly the way you want. Yep. It's unique, guys. Keep that in mind. You can fly it how you want. You can fly it scale-like. You can fly it sport. You can fly it 3D. Um, you can fly it however you want, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see some repaints. Oh yeah, absolutely. And we see some more scale-inspired um, finishes. Yeah. I think that's gonna be cool to see. So be sure to share those with us uh, on our Facebook page in yep. particular. And uh, one extra little note, the decal sheet does come oh, with that's right. basically yeah. all the uh, different markings. You got Navy, Air Force, Marines, um, US Coast Guard, and then it also comes with a couple extra little decals you can put around it. It comes with some numbers, so you can actually customize with your number on the tail that you want. That's um, nice. So that's, that's a nice thing to at least personalize your airplane a little bit. And again, there's a, it's a pretty pretty easy airplane to repaint, I think. Uh, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be excited to see some military-inspired inspired repaints of this thing. So, so what we're seeing here sticker-wise, this is what it comes with out of the box. Correct. No steps, um, a couple of tank markings here, yep. fuel markings here, uh, but then the rest, Navy's Marine, Navy Marines, yep. uh, Coast Guard I think will be very popular, of course. Air Force. You can, you can put, put those stickers, stickers on, those decals on as you see fit. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, personalize it accordingly. Absolutely. We're looking forward to seeing a lot of these at the field. Hopefully a lot of these things find in formation. Yeah. I think that'd be one of the coolest things if we get three or four of these up there, five, six of them, and then drop stuff. Formation dropping, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, oh, and then formation hovering. Of course. So and you can do that all in the same flight, guys. Yeah. You can do the go up, fly in formation, drop stuff out, then bring them all on the deck and hover them. I mean, what airplane can do that? Right. There isn't an airplane that can do that. So thanks again, guys, for joining us. Um, be sure to check out more information on our product pages. Check out the video on YouTube. We show Absolutely. a little bit of everything. Yep. It's really hard to capture all of it, uh, but I think that shows a little bit of most of it. Yeah, I think the only thing we missed was, uh, like Jason mentioned earlier, the ski stuff, just because uh, not too much oh, yeah, snow yeah, in the middle yeah, of yeah. summer here. So Exactly. <laughs> all righty. Thank you, guys.